Growing up in Mūpara, there was a lot of, uh, at that time, a lot of, especially Māori battalion guys come back in the Second World War. And I think that put a perspective on things to actually be in the services, you know. Well, I was brought up with um, my foster dad, him and his first wife. They were ex-army, brought up in that sort of lifestyle of being military orientated. I always dreamt of that. Brought up being in the hunting, hunting out in the bush. And then when it was time to get to about 15, 16, you know, you start looking, start, they start telling you, you better start thinking about what you want to do when you grow up. So my first option was to go to the army. I was born in Tokopru, uh, a little farming community on the west coast, uh, just south of Dargaville. Eight in the family, including me, uh, we all served in the New Zealand Army. Two of the older brothers served in Korea, Japan. Adrian uh, served with SAS in Malaya back in the, in the 50s. He was killed over there in 1956. Patrick, uh, the older brother from me, served in uh, Borneo, Malaya, and South Vietnam. My motivation to join the army, I think came from my brother that was killed in Malaya. I was born in Kaio Hospital, Whangaroa, uh, and raised uh, in Waitaruke, the small Catholic community. Uh, we were taught by the nuns there. 67, I'd lost my bursary. I thought I'd head home, work in the freezing works. On the bus, got to Whangarei, and we had about a, an hour wait I just happened to be walking down the road and I saw the army office and so I went in and told them I was interested in uh, joining the army. I just said, oh, who goes to Vietnam? Strange thing, I've always wanted to be a nurse. When I was about five or six, I remember coming to Rotorua and the war was still on, the Second World War, and there were bands, army bands going around. I was absolutely fascinated and my mother literally dragged me along by my hand because I couldn't stop listening or looking and I don't know why but I always felt that I wanted to be an army nurse to look after six soldiers. Left school in what 1953 and um, then I started cadets in 1954. There was a promotion put out about becoming an officer so I applied and went to the selection board. The chairman of that board was uh, Brigadier Leonard Thornton, because he was an old boy of Christchurch Boys High. So my turn came up, I go in, and he starts off, well, Rodder, I'm sorry to tell you, the board have not recommended you. But then he carried on talking, and I suddenly realised what he was talking about, is that he thought that I did have the ability to be an officer and he was going to put me through. I was born in Rotorua in uh, 1949 and went to school there for a few years uh, and then our family shifted to Taupo. My dad served in Italy in the Second World War and my uncle was a prisoner of war. And in those days they were inclined not to tell us kids anything about their war experiences, which is a shame. And my brother, eldest brother, joined the army three years ahead of me. I remember going to Rotorua and I remember being asked by the staff sergeant recruiter there. He said, why do you want to join the army? I said, oh, it's in the blood. three Victor companies before us and one uh, whiskey company. Forming that company, the previous companies had mainly infantrymen, infantry soldiers. For our company, because they were getting short of infantry soldiers, they put out the plea back in New Zealand to anybody in the army who wanted to go to Vietnam uh, could come along could join up. And so we got what some people considered a ragtag company. 
at the time, 1968, recruiting had dropped considerably. Like my mate, uh, Rick, he'd just done his 10 weeks uh, basic before they went to Malaya. They hadn't been in a company exercise or anything. So they were basically just rushed through. We talk about cannon fodder, you know. Our training was superb. There's only one word for it, superb. And the reason why is we were trained by our own guys who had just returned from Vietnam. They had spent a year there. They came back to Malaysia and they were our teachers. That was the first whiskey company. At that time, all, all the officers sort of, you know, they were all part of the troops, you know, there was none of this standoffers, you know. You might have a bit of a sing-along and a barbecue and all that. Uh, yeah, old Mighty Quinn and old uh, Stan Kidd was another another officer, but he, you know, sadly he got killed at the end of the tour. Sort of had that mix where everybody enjoyed one another, you know, and you sort of, and I think that's where the camaraderie and respect start to build up in, you know, in individuals. It was one big family working together. It was that bond of a mixture coming together and working together that really worked. The bond that has continued after we got back has really emphasised that. Yeah, so those bonds, you know, they're really close. You're closer to these guys than they are to your own family. Pilots said, well, you're getting close to Vietnam, so many of our minutes to landing. The whole inside of the Hercules went quiet, you know, you can look around, everybody's all nervous, hoping to get shot down and all those sort of things, you know. You've got all these things running through your mind. We landed at Vung Tau, quarter past ten, local time, 8th of May, 1969. The doors of the Herc flew open as we were taxiing down the uh, run away, the warm air came through. And then when we touch down, get out there, then there's, uh, there's Victor Sri on the airstrip. They were on their way home after a year in Vietnam. They were taking our plane. And they were ready to go and they said, they telling us, oh, you got 365 days and awake, you know, that was our 12 months. And, and uh, yeah, and then the Australians had their band, you know, their thing band, army band playing, we welcomed ourselves to Vietnam. Well, I know one thing that really uh, struck me was the amount of uh, American equipment. All these helicopters, you see these gunships, and you're just overwhelmed with all the equipment, you know. And then you start realizing, yeah, how much America has committed to this. Then we were marshaled over to an area where we got our first taste of war, and that we were given live ammunition. Each person was given a magazine of live rounds to their appropriate weapon. The machine gunners were given a belt of ammunition for theirs. Our war had begun from that day. We're driving up from, uh, from Vang Tau to our base in Nui Dat, which involved something like 20 plus kilometers. And you go through all these villages and you, wow, is that a Vietnamese, is that, you know? You, but then again, you, you realize that, hey, they're just people like us too. But uh, initially, yeah, yeah, I'm finally here. That truck ride out to Nui Dat, you know, um, having not been in the country before, it was like um, a huge adrenaline rush, you know, uh, just sitting in the truck and you'd never blink, you know, because, um, you don't want to miss anything in case somebody is looking at you. Then we arrived in Nui Dat, our base of the first task force, uh, and we were welcomed by 2IC Captain Quinn Rodder and a group of our guys uh, who had, with the advance party, come up a couple of weeks before us. And it was essentially just a matter of 
unpacking our things and settling in. Our, our tents were really good. Uh, there were three or four man tents, had a bed, had a mosquito net, a mattress, sheets, pillow, to flash, wooden floor, uh, sandbagged around the, uh, the sides for protection. So it was really uh, quite comfortable. That was our home. Now for the first uh, approximate two weeks, we were training on our own because the day we arrived in Vietnam was the day Six Ra left Australia by a, an aircraft carrier. But once they arrived and we amalgamated, our correct title from then on was Victor Four Company, Six RAR, NZ, Anzac Battalion. So we were Anzacs. It was one Australian field hospital and that was in the logistic support group of the Australian, one ALSG. And our hospital of course was brand new, 110 beds, 50 surgical beds, 50 medical beds and it was air conditioned. And I was firmly told by them up there that the New Zealanders had a most terrible reputation for coming in with malaria because they wouldn't take their anti-malarial tablets. And I thought, right, if I do nothing else, I'm going to make sure that, you know, we will stop that reputation. The first couple of weeks was pretty much bound uh, to Nui Dat and just doing small patrols. But we worked and learnt how to work with the APCs, the armed personnel carriers, how to work with helicopters, you know, just getting ourselves ready. But in our area, there were two BC regiments. They weren't expected to be there. They thought it was an area that was relatively clear and therefore, yes, we would have a bit of freedom to get used to working in the country. Um, but we came across this regiment. And then our first operation, we virtually had contact immediately sort of thing. You saw a lot of white Maoris, mate. You see the blood running down their faces when we had our first contact. You know, that's uh, it scared the shit out of everybody. We're off on our first operation. Again, it's just like you're going on an exercise. You get all your gear on, make sure your pack is packed, you've got three days rations and all your spare clothing and yeah, all your ammunition, everything's clean. And then you go down to the helicopter pad. Holy heck! There were about eight choppers uh, on there sitting ready to go. So we were the first uh, stick, they call it, out onto the uh, choppers. So I was the 2IC of the section. Uh, I was one of the last on. Now the guys before me take their packs off, throw in the middle, and they sit on the seat. Uh, me and Padre, we were the last guys there. No more seats, so we had to sit on the floor. All pile into the helicopter and Oh, it's just amazing, you know, as they all lift up, up into the air and you man, oh man. There were no doors on the choppers. You could easily fall out, no, uh, no safety harnesses. Hear the guns going off in the background and they're just blowing the place up and as you get up into the air you can see where the shells are landing and the pilot said oh that's where you're going <laughs> and then next minute we see these jets coming letting off their rockets all on the same area and we said oh we must be going down there they're going to kill all the enemy down there before we go oh give them heaps you're made away you're in a war zone now it's no exercise just as we're coming in, that's when the machine gunners on either side started firing. And they were just literally spraying all the bush um, where we were about to land to make sure it was clear. 
That was called a hot insertion. By the end of that operation, which was about four weeks, there was not much left of that VC regiment. Um, we didn't hear much of them about them later on. So we, we really socked it to them. The mode of operation over there on our first stop was uh, we spent one night as a company together and um, platoons went their own way. And that uh, the platoon is about 30 guys. Um, so we had three platoons went off in separate directions. That way you cover more ground and are able to uh, locate and destroy the enemy. I went up to Vietnam from Malaysia as a lead scout. So right at the front on patrol, would be the lead scout, and he was the eyes and ears of everybody. Uh, right behind him would be the cover scout. Behind the cover scout would be the section commander. With the section commander would be a radio operator. Behind that would be a rifleman, a 2IC, another rifleman, till you get right back to tail end Charlie. Our first night as a platoon, we put up an ambush lying in wait on ground of your choosing of a well-defined track. The ambush is not initiated by machine guns. It is initiated by claymores. These are the uh, directional mines that contain 700 ball bearings. They're on a shape so that they are directional. And generally, we would have a bank of four on the right-hand side and a bank of four on the left-hand side. Well, about two o'clock in the afternoon, next minute, boom! Then all hell broke loose, because when the contact is initiated, then those in the forward section can start firing. So here's our chance to have a fire. So everybody opened up and it was a massive fire. Anyway, it died down, uh, and the boss gave orders to check, and the word came back, ah, oh, two enemy killed. Oh, gee, our first kill, so that was good. So I thought, we're, oh, well, we're going to pack up and move away. No, no, the boss says, bring them out the back, dig a hole at the back, bury them at the, hole, uh, at the back, reset the ambush. Half an hour later, it's ready to go. Lo and behold, three or four hours later, more enemy come down, boom, same thing happened. So we started uh, very successfully uh, with ambushes. So that was, uh, I thought, the way, way to go. But... Our OC had different ideas. Sometimes he wanted us to walk, walk, walk. Uh, we got the nickname of Larry's Leapers. Uh, and that was from our commanding officer's name because of his wanting to walk everywhere. Insects, snakes, whatever you want to talk about, uh, but never really worried too much about that because I think they were the friendly part of the environment. The only things that really bothered me there was um, mosquitoes because, you know, during the wet season the mosquitoes would be so thick and we used to carry these, uh, these, these, these hoods and would put them on at night so we could go to sleep without mozzies chewing your face. Probably next to the Viet Cong they were the, the next worst thing. With our company, we came to a clearing uh, and it was probably about 400 metres wide. And I recalled seeing these little trees moving across on the far side. Um, and yes, you could tell that they had wounded there. So our platoon commander gave the order to fire. So we all opened fire. We all had a chance to have a yippee. Machine guns were blazing and the enemy took cover. After the firing had died down, the, uh, the gunships came in. And uh, I'll never forget the sight. Um, the lead uh, gunship was an American. And from way out, they fired their rockets onto this enemy position. And as they came down on our particular side, there was a big, big black Negro with a flak jacket on. And as he saw us down there, he gave the old 
Black Power salute and all the boys, hey! give them a wave and here we are cheering in the middle of one of the biggest contacts our platoon had ever had. First operation we had our first casualty. When he got killed, this was getting late in the evening, and we had struck a bunker system and we had to clear through it. And uh, during that, uh, Jack got shot. Um, when they brought his body out, it, it was quite dark. And we were called in to secure the, the pad where the chopper was going to come out. And it was because it was night, the chopper couldn't land on the ground. And because of the trees, close proximity, that they had to lower what they called um, yeah, a stretcher. Well, actually, it was something to pierce the, the jungle. Of course, they had to use the, the light from the helicopter so they could see. And there we were, right in the light, and you couldn't see out because it's so dark. You couldn't see out, and I thought, man, you're sitting duck sitting here, you know. And th that really struck home to me. What the heck are you doing here? It only hits you afterwards, you know. Uh, at the time, well, because everything is happening all at once, they have a contact. Next minute, we end up in a contact. Yeah, it's not until afterwards, you know, and then you realise, oh, poor old Jack, because we're all in cadets together, you know. Yeah, so, but then it makes you feel that uh, after our contact at the same night, the same day and same night, you know, it sort of makes you feel, you know, this is the, you know, we, we're part of the, part of the thing now, progress now, you know. Remember those things, but don't dwell on it too much. Or don't dwell on it, because it's only going to jeopardise the rest of your time there. You know, you're forever dwelling on. You, you've got to think about now. You don't say things to that might derail how other people are feeling about it. So I always try to keep the head up and the chest out, and you know, but. Uh, the reality was, uh, you know, it's a scary thing. The New Zealand admin officer came in and said, ah, yeah, here you are. They told me you were here. You've just lost a soldier. And I thought, oh, hell. And I said, oh, OK. Now, he said, what you've got to do is get yourself ready because you've got to go and identify him. So, and it just so happened that it was, you know, Jack Williams who had died, who had only come in. He hadn't come across with the original company. He'd only come in as a replacement um, about a week before. And he, unfortunately, he was, he was killed. So that was the first time that I realised that, yes, part of my duties as the company second in command was to identify our own fellows who were, were killed. But it also shook the lads. And in fact, for some time after that, we always had to be careful whenever we were around Vietnamese, uh, because the lads just hated it. You know, you've killed my mate. You've killed my mate. Um, and later on, a, a little bit later, we we had an operation where we went into a village and based ourselves in the village. And we had to start an operation of be nice. We had to keep on telling people, be nice. We've got to work with these people. You know, it's not necessarily them that have killed Jack. Um, and others that sort of followed shortly after. Uh, but yeah, it was a case of try to get people to calm down and just realise that, hey, this is part of what's going to happen here. And that was the big problem, you know, you did not know who your enemy was or who, who were friends. Well, it was a bit sad, really, when any of them died, and more so Kiwis, because if you'd been in the army long enough, you knew them. 
but as far as nursing is concerned, look, you just continued on with your job and you're always busy. Um, so things sort of, they were in your mind, but you didn't think about them too much. And perhaps maybe later in the evening, you know, you'd go back to our own quiet room and we'd talk amongst um, ourselves about things. And sure, we used to laugh, and, but there were a few tears as well. After a month, and it was just about 30 days, we were uh, ready to be pulled out back to our base. So I do remember when we landed at Nui Dat, the first thing I did when I got out of the chopper is I yelled at the top of my voice. I yelled. I don't know what I yelled, but I yelled. And what it was, it was the pent up emotion of whispering for a whole month. You try that whispering for a month, you go bloody crazy. So this is why I yelled out and it only lasted 10 seconds, but I'd got rid of it all and then I was back to normal. I can remember some really good barbecues. We had good hangies, you know, every now and again, we'd come back out of the bush and I'd arrange for a hangie to be put down. We had a movie theater, which is an old tent, uh, run on a 16 millimeter Bell and Howe projector, a bit like MASH. Uh, quite the same setting actually, uh, right next to the bar, uh, so we were able to let off a bit of steam there. Uh, beer was only 15 cents a can, um, the drinks were the same. I'm always shed, I'm Quinn. Well of course, over in Vietnam, uh, one of the popular songs at the time was the Mighty Quinn. Truly, you know, every time I would walk in, I didn't regularly go into the, the Never In bar, but after an operation, yes, I would go in and have a drink with the fellows. Quinn was our 2IC. He was our father figure who everyone in the company respected. We would also try and put one on when he'd come over at 10 o'clock and close the bar. We'd say, oh, another half an hour, another half an hour, like little kids at a, a party and all right, all right, all right then. So that's when we'd break into his favorite song, The Mighty Quinn. But they would always open up as soon as I walked in. Come on without, <laughs> come on within. You ain't seen nothing like the mighty Quinn. The previous company, Victor 3, had captured a Citroen car and they got it bought back and it was in at the workshops being fixed up. And the idea was that it would be given to the nurses. I was up the deck one day and asked if um, I'd be could would be interested in having a car, and um, it would have been disguised by the VC in the jungle. And apart from two great big poisonous snakes in the back seat, it hadn't been booby trapped, but it certainly had been well camouflaged. And I was asked about it, and I said, "Well, I'd very much think it'd be a great morale booster for us." So I got told by the workshops that yes, the car was ready. Uh, they said, "Well." What colour do you want it? And I said, oh, I wouldn't have a clue. He said, but yeah, you know, I said, it's for the ladies. What about pink? So sure enough, we, there was this car, pink car. When it was ready, we arranged with the nursing sisters and we went to Vung Tau and we handed over the car to Pam Miley. But it was lifted our morale, because I said to them that it's got to be an Anzac car for the Anzac sisters only, not driven by everybody. And I remember the day, beautiful sunny morning, clear still. And suddenly, about 50 yards in front of me, I saw a flash of black, which is the Viet Cong uniform. Next minute, the heart started pounding. Well, JT opened up. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Call that front, call that front. So everybody took their appropriate positions. Yeah, got the bastard. Now that's an unusual response when you uh, in a contact with the Vietnam, uh, Viet Cong. So we slowly all rose up and he's, he's standing up there as if nothing's happened. Oh, hey, well, there might be some more Viet Cong around. Anyway, we all walked up and lo and behold, it wasn't a dead VC, it was a dead pig. And it was a black wild pig. Oh man, everybody was standing around admiring this pig. Oh, we're gonna take it back. We'll, we'll have a hangi. Oh, the boys will be wrapped, so we loaded onto one of the boys' shoulders 
and we trundled off to the uh, to the roadside. And then one of the boys said, I think it was Eric Albert, I wouldn't eat that pig. Ah, we looked around. Why? Oh, they dig up and eat dead bodies. Oh, well, that put the kihu up us. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, straight away, no good. At about the same time as a local cart come past with three or four locals from the nearby village, that though, we stopped them. Hey, you fellas want a pig? Oh, big grin, eh? Hey? Big grin on their face. So we loaded the pig onto their trolley and sent them on their way. Oh, the, we were uh, Tatala number one Kiwi soldier. Number one Kiwi. When we got the opportunity, we'd all meet down in what we call a dust bowl, where they had all these concerts and like we had the, um, the Quintickies, I think it was. Mary High Five and all those groups. Yeah, we had a number of them come through. But interesting, they, they were contracted to the Americans, but they wanted to come down to meet up with the Kiwis, sing Hokey Mai and all that. <laughs> Throughout our tour of duty, we get the chance to go on a short 48 hour uh, stop down to uh, the Australian leave base at Vong Tau, uh, called the Peter Badco Club where we would go down there and uh, they had a swimming pool, bar, where we could relax. Our weapons were put in storage and we were able to go out uh, in the local community to the local bars. So I would like to do a waiata. The waiata was supposedly composed by a bar girl in Vong Tau. Her name was Mei Ling. And she worked at the Jig Jig Bar. The song that she composed was about the differences between the two soldiers, the Australians, who were called the Oktaloi, and the Kiwi soldiers were called Tantailan. Oktaloi, Chip Charlie, he know by me Saigon tea, Saigon tea cost very many pea. Oktaloi, Chip Charlie, Tantailan number one, he go a wall just for fun. Tantalan he very very fee, Uktaloi he chip Charlie. We take two 10 day leave periods. This 10 day period was a compulsory, everyone had to go back to Singapore. I'd enjoyed it, drank a lot of beer. Funny, you know, while you're down there, on, you're trying to relax, but you're worrying about your mates or any news from up top. Seven from just Victor Four. Or kill. So you, you're always interested or you know what's going on up there even though you're out of it you're supposed to be forgetting about it. So the, that went past quickly and then back into it again. Good morning Vietnam! Without doubt the Armed Forces Vietnam Radio Network was a saviour to, I would say, virtually every soldier in Vietnam. From Saigon, this is the American Forces Vietnam Network, presenting million dollar music for the Aquarian Age. The music that they had right throughout was absolutely brilliant. And we all used to have our uh, little transistors listening to AFVN radio. Now, we had a trick that the, the bosses didn't know about. At stand two, we would be uh, sitting down watching the enemy. Everyone would have their transistor radio in their hand with the earplug. The earplug would go down through the sleeve up here and plug in the ear, hidden by the jungle hat. So you're sitting there watching out for the enemy and listening to all the music. It, it, was, it was all right until a funny bit come on and then you hear the giggling going right around the perimeter and the boss say, what's everybody laughing for? That was the time of the landing of the moon. Uh, I remember, I think it was about half past 11 at night where we were all sitting around with transistors listening to them land on the moon. And we all uh, remember that to this day. But uh, a lot of the time was just basic patrolling, foot slogging, work that, uh, yeah, 
no one else wanted to do. <laughs> Just the infantry here. Uh, yeah. But we're doing a, a clearing operation. We could see um, C-130, but they'd come across and spray the bush. And you could see this uh, liquid coming out. We walked through there. Later, it would have taken us a couple of days to get there, to, to the area they, they sprayed, but still, you know. One particular instance I remember was involving Victor Four. They'd been ambushed and one of the chaps had been killed and another one had died later of his injuries. And the one instance I remember greatly was our um, quartermaster coming and asking me what was this he had in his hand and it was a very ancient Maori tiki, greenstone tiki. And I told him about it but I didn't say how valuable it was, I didn't say how ancient it was either but I said well if nothing gets back to the family that must go. But I couldn't help thinking that it was found in the pocket of this man's clothing, soldier's clothing, and it had snapped. Um, and there's part of me thinking that poor boy, he must have known he'd either be wounded or his last day had come. And I, I remember that. And anyway, when I went to the reunion, I told them about this, speaking to the, the group. And this old lady went away and she came back about 20 minutes later and she put the tiki in my hand. <laughs> and I really felt I was there very much that day, very back, back that very instant. The plan was for Victor Company, along with the other companies from the battalion, five companies all up, helicopter inserted to the top of the Nui Tai Vice. We moved off, we only gone about not even 20 minutes, 15 minutes and Mackie Parker came across all his tracks, you know, footprints and uh, he stopped the whole patrol. And I was backed up against the tree and I looked down to the ground in front of me and I had my M60 across my body like this and I saw two leads on the ground. Um, as soon as I saw the leads, I knew, I knew where we were. But I also knew that if I reacted to seeing those leads, they were going to set it off. I, I knew what, the, what, what had happened. We'd walked into an ambush. I didn't know where those leads were going to, but my guess was they were going to a claymore, a series of claymore mines that had already been set there during the night. And then my whole world just blew up. Everything just broke loose. You know, I, I didn't know what the hell was going on. There were explosions everywhere, you know, and uh, all I could see between me and Paul was a whole heap of shrapnel. All I can remember was floating in the air. But I got blown over in the, in, in the blast, and, and my ears were ring, everything was, and I had, I felt stings in my, as I was going over in my face and all that. And I, I thought, my God, I ran up to Paul. His arm was shattered, his right leg was shattered, uh, intestines out of his stomach, blood streaming down his head. He was, he was in a hell of a mess, you know. While I was lying on, on the ground, this bloke with this Viet Cong stood up in, on the rocks in front of us and was aiming his, you know, like I can see him aiming his AK-47 at me. And I, I, cause just before he popped up on the rock, I thought of my mum. I went to grab him, to pull him back. Then I realised somebody was bloody shooting at us with the, the top of his toes getting shot off, you know? And in that moment, then I, holy hell, we were getting fired at, you know? Yes, I, I picked up the machine gun. Because it was already, already set to go, picked up the machine gun and fired up on the rocks where this guy. And I saw this bloke standing on a rock. Next minute, it was like he was floating over the side. 
think it was 37 years later that I found out what happened. As soon as I fired, it sort of went down off the rocks. Whether I hit him or not, I don't know, you know. But when they did the sweep, they found all blood marks. But once everything calmed down and, and I had a medic come forward and I remember the medic just giving me jab after jab of, of morphine. So I never really felt any pain. And I happened to look down on my chest, down there, and I had a big blood stain. And I went, bloody hell, I've been wounded, you know, been hurt. They put me in one of these, these stretches, um, and they carried me to a point where they, where they felt the chopper would, because the chopper couldn't actually land. They had to drop a winch down through the trees and hook me up to the winch. Now the sad thing about it, when they lift their pole up, it's, instead of going up straight, it started to spin around. And then all the blood was like raining blood coming down from the thing. At the hospital, as we come in, we actually bounced along the, along the ground. I guess the chopper pilots might have been in a little bit of a hurry. You know, he was in a bad way. He was, he was, uh, I wasn't too bad. I had a, just shrapnel in the chest. Uh, in the arm, uh, ears, pellets in the face, both ears were blown, um, but I, we were both lying together and I was watching what they were doing to him, eh, you know. And I woke up in intensive care, I, I, I don't know how long afterwards, but I woke up in intensive care and I looked to one side and I, I could see this purple stuff there. And I looked up and it was the Padre. And I looked over to my other side and it was another Maryfield platoon sergeant, Tom Tuiwai. And I thought, shit, what's the Padre doing here? <laughs> you know? I guess there was something in Te Maori that We're going to keep you alive. And on May the 8th, exactly 365 days to the Tetter, we went down to Vong Tau and flew out on a Freedom Bird. It was a quiet affair, there were no cheering. Perhaps it was a reflection on the seven that weren't coming back with us. We arrived at 11 o'clock at night at uh Fenwapai, it's the quickest I've been through customs and yeah, yeah. Through, out the other side, here's your pay packet. See you, I think they gave us something like two months leave. See you back in Burnham on this date and we're gone. There were no politicians welcoming us. There was no high ranking officers in the army to welcome us. All there was, was a sergeant sitting behind a desk, name, Yep, here's your pay, here's your travel warrant. Get out of uniform as quickly as you can. See you later, bye. And that was it. So I ended up getting put in the orthopedic ward, which was Ward 20, I think it was, in Middlemore Hospital, right up the top. And that was my home for 13 months. It took me a long time to recover from all the injuries. After Middlemore, you were sent back up north. And then I managed to get a hold of him, and I said, I'm taking leave, and I'll come up. You know, and I said to Paul, they can't take those things away, you know, they, they will keep flooding back. And like I said to him, and I, it hasn't gone from mine, you know, I can still see the shrapnel. The big problems were to come later on, you know, when I, when I got married and had kids and, I, you know, I struggled to go to work because, of, you know, I, I was having pain problems and you just have to remain positive and, and uh, try and keep putting your best foot forward. And, you know, and I, I, th I think I've done that. Um, so I'm pretty happy where I am now. But I know there's a whole lot of vets out there that are, that, are, that are really struggling. For a long time, you know, I thought the Vietnam vets were treated very badly when they came home. People didn't really want to know about it because the job was hard. It was really hard work, but it was rewarding in many ways, you know. And um, 
when you meet together, you're talking about it, and it's like, well, it's a different family altogether. You know, it's a, it's a comradeship, mateship, whatever you like to call it, that doesn't exist in civilian life. I always think Victor Four, our unit, were unique. It has shaped me as to who I am now. You sort out your mates, you, even now, you, you know who your mates are. You know, we always thought Kiwis going to war that uh, we would get the backing of the entire population that wasn't to be. Uh, and when we come home, um, you know, we would, uh, we didn't ask for thanks, but the way we were treated was um, pretty, uh, pretty rough. We were rejected by the RSA, mainly those older members who looked on Vietnam as not being a war, but whatever you call it, a conflict. It was a conflict, not a war. Um, but it saddens me because now, now who runs the RSAs? It's the Vietnam veterans. So we've got to get away from that thinking. And um, as the president of the National Vietnam Association, I am pushing also that we be more inclusive, particularly with our new veterans coming through, the Bosnia veterans, uh, East Timor, Afghanistan, because otherwise we're going to repeat what we've been through. We know what it's like to be rejected. Welcome home. Only two words, two of the most significant words to Kiwi soldiers. So before 2008, I wrote to Helen Clark, the Prime Minister. I wrote to the Minister of Veteran Affairs. I says, if one of you speaks and address our veterans, you must say those two words, welcome home. I don't care what else you say, you say those two words. At that parade, her second sentence was, Welcome home. Welcome home.